everyone uh, to this Gerard uh, and uh, Cyril seminar where we have invited uh, Yang Zhu, a PhD candidate from University of Toronto. Uh, I'll let him introduce himself. And uh, the topic is uh, inverse optimization. And uh, without further ado, I let uh, Yang start his presentation and uh, let's see how it goes. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Raymond. Um, and thanks everyone for coming. Um, so, uh, as Freeman said, I'm Ian. I'm a fourth year PhD student at the University of Toronto. And uh, today I'll be talking about inverse optimization. So, inverse optimization, um, in my opinion, it's an, it's an up and coming research area that's um, been getting an increasing amount of attention uh, in recent years. Um, it's an area that I know uh, some people here might know well, but others um, might never have heard of it. And so, Today, I thought it would be a good idea for me to give a kind of hybrid uh, tutorial and research talk um, on this topic where I'll give a kind of general and broad overview of inverse optimization as well as my own uh, research contributions in it. And so before I start, um, I would like to say that uh, I would like this to be as uh, interactive and as fun as possible. So if you have any questions, um, please feel free to stop me at any time um, and ask those. Um, okay. Um, okay, so let's get started. Um, so my talk is going to be broken down into four parts. Um, first, I'm going to define what inverse optimization is. Um, oh, sorry, let me just... Uh, okay. Um, sorry, <laughs> everyone, sorry, one second. It's, there's, it's very noisy outside. Um, so first I'm gonna define what inverse optimization is uh, and describe two modeling paradigms to think about IO. Um, I'm gonna look at the first uh, paradigm which is called classical inverse optimization where I'll talk about how to solve inverse problems for linear and mixed integer um, problems. So the inverse of LPs and uh, mixed integer problems. Um, then I'm gonna um, look at uh, what's called noisy or data-driven inverse optimization and talk about some differences in this paradigm um, and how some of these ideas from the second section can be uh, translated into this third section. Um, and finally, I'm gonna give a, a quick summary of what I've talked about today, but more importantly, give my own kind of uh, perspective and uh, research outlook in this area. And so um, for those of you who are interested in, in anything that I talk about today, I do wanna advertise that. Um, I do have a, a survey paper, which you can find up on archive called um, Inverse Optimization Theory and Application. Okay, so let me define inverse optimization. Um, to do so, I wanna first revisit what, uh, how to think about a traditional optimization problem. So, Consider any generic optimization problem of this form. Um, this is a very typical form where you're trying to make some decision, uh, which I'll call X, um, that satisfies uh, a feasible, that lies within a feasible region capital X, and that minimizes um, objective function F. And in, in, in traditional optimization, you're always trying to find the best solution. Again, that minimizes an objective, satisfies a set of constraints. And so in this, my part, in this particular definition of the optimization problem, I have this additional uh, theta term, which is just going to be some kind of to help define the objective function. So you can think of this as any kind of uh, generic contextual parameter. Um, a, a kind of classic optimization problem and one that I'm sure everyone here knows and that's presented kind of in any introductory optimization course is this knapsack problem. And so in a knapsack problem, um, we have a bunch of items um, shown here uh, that each have some kind of, uh, that each take up some amount of volume and we wanna put the best subset of items into a knapsack um, that has some capacity constraint. Um, in, in, in the knapsack problem, um, to find the best subset of items, this requires us to give some uh, definitions of the values of each item, right? So I might prefer, I might have a specific valuation of each of these items. You and the audience might have a specific valuation of each of these items, but in the 
um, given our item valuations, we want to find the best subset of items. And our item valuations is what's going to be defined by this or represented by this uh, contextual parameter theta. So an inverse optimization problem is the problem of fitting model parameters of an optimization problem to a set of solutions. So instead of giving, being given model parameters and trying to find an optimal solution, we're going to be given a solution that we're going to try to find model parameters for, and specifically model parameters that make that solution optimal. And so an example of this would be, suppose I were to observe a choice of the blue, the green, and the gray out of these six different items that someone put in their knapsack. And so this specific choice I'm going to denote as x hat. And in the inverse optimization problem is going to be um, trying to fit the uh, theta parameter to this x hat, meaning trying to find the theta that makes x hat optimal. And a slightly more general version of this is you might want to fit a theta to a specific set of solutions, um, which I'll call x hat and index by i, just meaning a, a set of different instances. So an example of this would be, suppose you're trying to fit item valuations to a set of specific knapsack choices given different knapsack constraints. Okay, so um, this is kind of a, a toy example to help think about what inverse optimization is. Um, in practice, um, inverse optimization can be used in a variety of different application domains. So if we're thinking about estimation and learning problems, um, you can apply these in, in applications ranging from finance to transportation to uh, energy uh, to healthcare. So in finance, for example, you might observe how someone is choices. And based on how someone is investing, you can then try to learn about um, um, specific item valuations or risk preferences. You might observe how someone is picking their own travel routes, and you can use this to try to infer driver preferences. If those routes were to represent, for example, expert decisions, then you could also use those routes to try to learn tacit knowledge or um, knowledge that the driver themselves may have difficulty putting in explicit numerical values. Um, you can think of similar ideas for modeling, uh, for estimating um, from energy uh, like consumption uh, patterns, as well as learning about um, clinician uh, uh, preferences for patient trade-offs by observing what kind of medical treatments the clinicians come up with. And examples where I'll, we can think about using op inverse optimization to learn some information, which we can then use in some kind of downstream prescriptive problem. And so in the applications I've listed, this prescriptive problem can be some kind of uh, recommendation system, a personalized uh, recommendation system. Now, if um, I think someone's uh, microphone is on, but um, now, if we're thinking about uh, inverse optimization and this problem of fitting model parameters so that specific solutions become optimal, we can also think about applications in the context of um, uh, design or, or uh, classic bi-level optimization problems. So instead of trying to learn from specific observed decisions, as we saw here, we can also apply inverse optimization to try to induce specific behavioral um, um, uh, choices. So for example, you might use inverse optimization to infer tolls that induce a specific travel pattern, taxes or subsidies that induce a specific energy production plan, or a mechanism that induces um, agents to act cooperatively rather than competitively. Okay, so now let me formally define um, um, the inverse optimization problem that I will uh, uh, go through in, in this talk. So uh, for, for simplicity, I'm going to refer to um, uh, this constraint very often. So this is going to be a, um, the set of, so capital X op um, is going to denote the set of optimal solutions um, when I have theta in my objective function. And so this again is, is the same formulation we had before, the kind of traditional optimization problem. And in our context, this will be called the forward problem. 
And these are going to be the optimal solutions of the forward problem under a model input theta. So I've as I've defined thus far, um, we can think about classical inverse optimization as a problem which has this constraint. And so this constraint here is called the inverse feasibility constraint. And all that it means is that um, we're required to find um, thetas such that any target x hat that we obtain um, becomes an optimal solution, meaning x hat has to lie in the optimal solution set. And you might have additional um, constraints on your theta yeah, in the form of uh, capital theta. And so an example of this would be, suppose you just want to learn a non-negative valuation. And finally, if you have many different choices of thetas, you might also want to choose a theta um, from among which uh, minimizes an additional objective function, right? The, but the main kind of characteristic of inverse optimization problems is really this constraint, finding theta such that your given decisions um, can be rendered optimal. So this is going to be the first paradigm of inverse optimization. Um, the second paradigm will, um, is called data-driven or noisy inverse optimization. And this considers, uh, this applies mainly in the case where this first model is infeasible, meaning you can't actually find a specific theta that renders all of these points um, optimal. And so in this case, instead of having these as constraints, we're going to have proxies of these constraints or relaxations of these constraints in terms of loss functions. And so these loss functions are going to measure the fit of uh, x hat and this set of optimal solution x opt given some theta. And similarly, we have our, our original objectives and constraints that uh, um, you can replace. Um, with anything else. And so finally, I, I want to remark here that um, I'm going to be talking mainly about um, using inverse optimization to infer parameters in the objective function of a forward problem. Um, there has been work on um, inverse optimization to infer constraint parameters. Um, and so you can check out these references um, if you're interested. And so the rest of my talk is going to basically follow the slide. So I'm going to spend uh, quite a bit of time next talking about how to solve this model um, when your forward problem, meaning this problem here, is either linear or is mixed integer. Um, and then I'm going to talk about this model, some differences with model one, and how some of the insights from model one can apply here. And then finally, I'll give my own kind of research perspective of um, different uh, models and um, and uh, extensions that you can consider. So I'm gonna stop here for our questions. Uh, so I see Ernest has a question. Um, I'm not sure I understand. Uh, Ernest, would you be willing to elaborate? Um, while we're waiting, does anyone else have questions? Um, Ernest, I'm not sure what uh, Ising models are. Okay, um, if not, I'm going to uh, keep going. <clears throat> okay, so now I'm gonna talk about um, how to solve inverse optimization problems for linear and, and mixed integer problems. So let's start with linear forward problems. So um, suppose the forward problem is this linear program, um, which is minimize X um, subject to theta transpose X. And I'm just defining so this is my f of x from before. I'm just giving it this particular structure um, just for simplicity. 
and X has to satisfy uh, these set of linear inequalities. So given this forward problem, which um, can represent problems such as routing problems, and you want to try to learn from, let's say, shortest path, then we can define the inverse optimization problem as this particular model. Um, so this is the same model as I had before, right? Except now I've just explicitly written X hat as having to be uh, um, an optimal solution to this forward problem. Same set of constraints, same objective function. Um, here, I'm just going to, just for simplicity, I'm going to explicitly define what a possible objective function can be. So um, a, a common one is to um, try to find a theta that is as close as possible to um, a theta naught. And so in estimation problems, this theta naught might be your a priori estimate of what um, theta can be. Whereas in your design problems, the problems where you want to induce a particular decision, theta naught might be um, the objective function of the, of the decision maker right now. And you want to perturb it in, a, in the minimal way possible such that a particular decision you want them to take becomes um, an optimal decision. Okay. So um, now with this inverse problem, we can think about how do we want to solve this problem? So the challenge with this problem right now is that <clears throat> this itself is a bi-level optimization problem, right? You have this outer problem of trying to find um, um, thetas, which are your variables, but your theta has to uh, render x hat optimal for another optimization problem. So we want to somehow reflect a uh, bi-level optimization problem. And if you've worked in inverse optimization or robust optimization or bi-level optimization, um, you know the kind of classic trick for LP problems <clears throat> is to reformulate the set of constraints using strong duality. So this basically says that um, any theta that makes x hat optimal has to satisfy these constraints, right? So um, this is strong duality. The left side is the, is the objective value of your primal problem. The right side is the objective value of your dual problem. Um, your lambdas are going to be your dual variables, which have to satisfy dual feasibility. Okay, so again, any theta that makes x hat optimal has to satisfy um, the set of duality constraints. So with that, then we can rewrite this inverse linear optimization problem as a linear optimization problem, right? And the linear optimization problem is going to look like this. This is just from the previous slide. I just replaced the constraints with a strong duality conditions. And the main takeaway here is that the inverse of the linear optimization problem can itself be solved as a linear optimization problem by defining additional uh, variables lambda. Um, and for me, the more interesting problem becomes what if we want to uh, solve inverse problems when the forward problems are mixed integer programming models? Meaning what if we want to find a theta that makes x hat um, optimal over this MIP? And so uh, again, before I proceed, let me just uh, stop here to see if there are any questions. Uh, so uh, the each forward the each forward problem could be associated with multiple uh, inverse problems, uh, and here you are saying that it's up to the decision maker how he chooses the inverse problem. Uh, I mean, which inverse problem he wants to solve, basically, right? Um, because the loss that you have defined that theta naught should be close to theta is just one yes. of the objectives that a decision maker can have, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it, it, this one is just a particular choice. It's just yeah. for me to help uh, 
people think about what uh, what an objective function could be. Okay. Yeah, good question. And uh, I have a follow-up question. So does this like arise from the context of the problem or is it something that uh, it's like a usual uh, loss functions that people use? Um, I would say both. So this is usually the a pretty standard loss function that people use. Um, the motivation is basically, um, as I said kind of earlier, that um, in, in estimation problems, this might represent some kind of initial guess. Um, whereas in these kind of design applications, um, this is the current state of the system and you want to perturb the current state of the system in a minimal way. Yeah, but there, there's definitely different objective functions that you can think of. Um, this doesn't really do, the, the choice of the objective function doesn't change um, the, the methods that will be proposed because all methods in inverse optimization um, in, the, in this kind of classical world really just revolve around uh, trying to find ways of solving the constraint. The, the constraint is the bottleneck, not the objective function. Great. Um, anyone else? Okay. Um, so if not, then we can think about, uh, okay. So, so next I'm gonna talk about how to um, handle this constraint. So if we're really thinking about what this constraint is saying, it's simply saying, you know, again, find me the theta that makes X hat optimal over my feasible region, All right? And so in this case, we can uh, um, kind of argue from first principles that all that that means is that any objective function with theta hat, the, that objective function value should be less than or equal to any other feasible point for that objective function. Okay, so from first principles, we can argue that that same um, argument inverse feasibility constraint can be modeled by this set of uh, constraints, meaning that theta transpose x hat has to be less than or equal to theta transpose x for all possible feasible points. And if this is true, then by definition, we found the theta um, that makes x hat optimal over this feasible region, right? And so based on this constraint, then we can rewrite the inverse feasible, uh, inverse optimization problem from before as this uh, problem here. So same objective such that the constraints have to satisfy the set of constraints. So this seems like obviously a, a, a simpler representation. And so a natural question to ask is, why did I just spend you know, five to 10 minutes giving this strong duality argument? Right, well, there's, there's um, a couple of reasons. So we can look at the set of constraints and we can think about this. So first, if your feasible region is, um, is, is unbounded, then we're going to have an infinite set of constraints here. Second, if your feasible region is bounded, but you have continuous variables, you're still going to have an infinite set of constraints here. Third, if your feasible region is bounded, does not have continuous variables, and, but only discrete variables, then the set of constraints requires you to enumerate every, every single feasible point in the feasible region. So working with this set of constraints is clearly um, impractical in, in most problems. Okay. So in 2009, a paper came out that showed that uh, constraint three is equivalent to uh, this set of constraints. And so first let's just think about the case where uh, capital X is uh, the feasible region is bounded. So when the feasible region is bounded, um, the result says that, um, any theta that makes x hat better than any x where x is the extreme point of the convex hull of capital X, um, this, this set of constraints for your theta is equivalent to uh, the constraint set three. 
the reason why this is useful is because this can be, uh, this one is a finite number of constraints and two, it can be a set of constraints that's smaller than, than this set. When capital X is unbounded, then we can add additional uh, constraints of this form, um, which basically fix theta to point in a direction that for which the problem is bounded. Because at the end of the day, we're trying to find a theta that makes x hat optimal. So that theta clearly cannot point in an unbounded direction because otherwise x hat won't be optimal. And so that's what this set of constraints does. All right, but the basic takeaway from this is that um, constraint three, which is usually an infinite set of constraints and one that's very difficult to work with, can be reformulated as this more uh, possibly more tractable set of constraints. So visually, how does this look? Um, so let's think of this uh, 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 illustration of um, x hat being on a two-dimensional lattice, right? So um, the blue is going to define your linear inequalities. And uh, because these are all uh, integer variables, um, your feasible points are on the lattices of this gray shaded area. And what this result is saying, um, this result, is that as long as I find any theta, and in this space, we can imagine theta as just being a vector pointing in some direction. As long as we find any theta that makes x hat optimal over each of these extreme points, then we've made x hat optimal over um, any of the other lattice points in this uh, gray area, right? And the, the kind of, uh, the argument is that uh, any point in this area can be defined as a convex combination of these extreme points. So as long as you have a theta that makes x hat optimal over these extreme points, then you've made x hat over this, x hat optimal over this feasible region. And this is important because now we can think about building a cutting plane algorithm to um, generate these constraints on the fly. <clears throat> Okay, and the, the cutting plane algorithm is actually very um, intuitive. So um, just for simplicity, for, for illustration, I'm going to assume we're solving an inverse problem just for a single point, meaning we just wanna find a theta that makes a single point x hat um, optimal. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start at iteration k is equal to zero. Um, we're gonna start with an empty set. And this empty set uh, will denote the set of extreme points or the set of feasible points that I've found so far, right? So at the start, I found nothing. And, and this um, set is going to be defined by this uh, X tilde. Okay. So um, in this decomposition problem, we're going to have a master problem and the sub problem. So the master problem is just going to be the inverse optimization formulation but only rather than all of the feasible points here, we're going to replace it with only the set of uh, points that we've discovered, right? So make X hat optimal over the set of points that we've discovered. At the beginning, we haven't discovered any points. And so this master problem is going to return a, uh, uh, a theta hat. And so this will be a candidate theta or our best guess so far. Okay, so we're going to take this best guess then and we're going to um, solve the forward problem with that best guess. And solving that forward problem with the best guess is going to be called the subproblem. And then from the subproblem, we're going to get some x tilde k, which is our optimal solution. And the termination condition is simple. So we terminate if theta transpose x is equal to theta transpose x tilde k. Basically, what this means is as long as if that theta make x hat optimal, then we found the right theta and we're done, right? Otherwise we add this x tilde k, which is called a violated point. It's violated because x tilde will have a better objective value than uh, x hat. Um, so that theta simply can't be the right theta. And so we're going to add that to our set of discovered extreme points and we're going to continue. Okay, um, I think this is also a good place for me to stop to see if there are questions.
uh, where did you use the fact that uh, this um, this set of this um, basically the result that uh, from Wang? Where did you use that result? I mean, I could not figure out. Oh, oh yeah. So it's this it's this thing here, right? So if I solve um, this optimization problem, we're going to get an extreme point. So this is going to be an extreme point. Okay. And so, so even if I didn't know Wang and I just like intuitively started, uh, uh, it's just a theoretical result, right? In Wang, right? That this algorithm will converge to the optimal solution. In, in fi a finite number of iterations. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. Yeah, it, this is a very, yeah, it's, good. it's a good question. This is a very intuitive result uh, uh, or algorithm, yeah. You basically propose something and then you try that and, and so on, yeah. Thanks. Okay, good. Um, so let me just quickly uh, give a kind of illustrative example of how this looks in the original knapsack problem. All right, so in the knapsack problem, um, we're just going, we're assuming the four problem is a, is a maximization problem, right? So we wanna find a set of item valuations data that makes um, a specific knapsack choice x hat greater than all the other uh, knapsack choices that I could have made. And so um, um, the algorithm basically says, okay, let me start off with my x hat, my x hat being this choice of green, gray, and blue. And I wanna find item valuations that makes this specific choice better than all the choices I could have made. So initially I have no other choices I could have made. Um, so my master problem is going to return theta naught, which is my first initial guess. I'm going to, so this is going to be my initial guess as to item valuations. I'm going to solve the knapsack problem using theta naught. I'm going to get a new knapsack, right? And this new knapsack of gray, yellow, and gray, let's say this new knapsack gives me a higher item valuation than this x hat. In that case, theta naught can't be the right solution. And so I'm going to add this now as a new constraint, meaning theta transpose this solution has to be greater than theta transpose this solution, get a theta one, and then repeat this process again. Maybe I'll get a new solution. Maybe this solution is still better than x hat. Then I'll get a new theta and I'll keep trying and eventually I'll converge. Okay, so uh, as kind of what Saf pointed out, um, this uh, algorithm is very intuitive and it will converge in a finite number of iterations, but there are also some downsides. Right? And the two main downsides is that one, it requires solving the forward problem um, repeatedly, right? The forward problem with a slightly different objective, you have to solve that repeatedly. And if we're thinking about difficult forward problems, um, like if we're trying to learn parameters of difficult or complex mix integer optimization problems, then repeatedly solving this forward problem can be very expensive. Similarly, empirically, um, because we are enumerating um, extreme points, it's possible to enumerate a very large set of them. So not only is it expensive to, to solve the subproblem, but you might need to solve the subproblem a very large uh, number of times. And so in, in um, one of my research papers, we asked the following research question of, can we design a new algorithm <clears throat> that generates both faster and stronger cuts? And the main result relies on two observations. Um, I, I won't give any of the theoretical details here, but the, um, uh, I would be happy to discuss them offline. But the two observations are that um, one, you don't need to generate the extreme points and two, you um, only need uh, points that lie on the same facet as, as X hat. So what this means graphically or, um, is that as long as we find any theta that makes X hat better than this point here and one of these two points, then we found a theta that makes x hat better than all of these points. Okay, so we don't need these extreme points. We only need this point and one of these two points to help define our inverse feasible region. 
And so based on this observation, <clears throat> we define what's called a, a trust region around X hat. And so this trust region is going to look something like this, um, where um, this is going to be a variable and it's going to be bounded by some fixed delta. And so an example of this would be this trust region uh, where delta is equal to two. And so a two uh, uh, a Manhattan normed uh, trust region of size two. The reason why this um, um, might be more useful is because first, um, if we were to intersect this trust region with the feasible region, we get this reduced feasible region here, which is smaller and oftentimes can be much simpler than the general complex uh, feasible region, All right? And two, if we have this trust region here, then you can see that um, as long as I find the theta that makes X hat optimal over these three extreme points here, then I've made X hat optimal over each of these seven extreme points or more generally just over the whole feasible region. And so if we're going to define some kind of um, cutting plane algorithm within this trust region, I would have um, to enumerate at most three of these points, meaning I would have that to consider at most three iterations um, rather than you know, possibly many more. Okay, so um, with these insights, we define a, a trust region enhanced cutting plane algorithm where we take our original subproblem which is this forward problem, remember, with the candidates, our best guess, uh, theta hat. And we're going to replace this subproblem by a similar subproblem with one distinct difference, which is that X has to lie in a trust region as well. And so this trust region is going to be updated with each iteration k. Um, I won't give the algorithm, but um, in words, um, basically the algorithm is we start with very small trust regions. Um, we exhaust the cuts within these trust regions and we iteratively grow them larger and larger. <laughs> we also, um, so that's basically the main, um, the main uh, addition to the, the algorithm. We also define two additional enhancements that can help speed up the algorithm um, sometimes. Um, one is we call a low dimensional trust region, which is exactly the trust region that we had before, except that we explicitly fix some of the elements to be equal to some elements of X hat. Um, and we do this in a kind of random stochastic way. And the reason why this might make sense is because if my X hat was defined in a discrete space, if you were to look at this constraint, then, um, then by definition, if X hat is in a discrete space, then at most delta number of um, elements of X can deviate from the elements of X hat. And so for us, as, we, as long as we fix what these elements are, then we can define uh, subproblems that are of strictly lower dimension. We also um, add a new enhancement, which, is, uh, which we just call an early stop enhancement. Um, which simply just stops the subproblem uh, once it's ex exceeded some uh, time threshold and once it's found a violated cut. And the reason why this is useful is because um, oftentimes uh, the subproblem, because we're just passing it to a generic MIC solver, um, the subproblem might have found a violated cut a long time ago, but it's still trying to prove optimality or it's still trying to generate better cuts. Um, early stop just simply says, once a time, once we've reached the time threshold and we found a valid cut, we can just stop this problem. And so we test our algorithm with this enhancement on um, a large set of instances from the MIPLIB library um, where uh, we consider 73 different MIPLIB problems and for each we generate three distinct uh, inverse optimization um, instances. And we do so by basically um, solving uh, the MIPLIB problem, getting the solution, taking that as X hat, and then defining um, a random objective uh, theta naught 
and seeing how long it takes us to solve the uh, classical inverse optimization problem. And so I want to emphasize here that um, the, the problems that we consider um, vary uh, greatly in terms of problem structure from pure binary problems to pure integer problems to mixed integer problems. And they vary greatly in terms of um, number of variables and, and number of constraints as well. And we fit a, a, just a single untuned um, uh, trust region based algorithm on all of these instances at the same time. So here's kind of a snapshot of our results. Um, for each of these instances, we gave the algorithms uh, an hour to try to solve the instances. And so the main takeaway here is that if we give each instance an hour, the cutting plane algorithm can solve 66 instances. Um, if we give it some of our enhancements, so the early stop and the trust region, it can solve more. And then finally, if we in, um, combine our um, enhancements with the trust region, then we can solve the same number of instances, 66 of them, in, in on average in 90 seconds. And so this is a, this is a 97.5% uh, reduction in solution time. Again, using an algorithm that is untuned over, over a large number of problem uh, structures. So then we can think about, we also think about, you know, um, why did it perform so well, right? So then we can look at these two factors of, of cut generation time and of number of cuts that were needed. So in cut generation time, we can look at how long did it take to derive a cut within a specific trust region? And so when I don't have a trust region, the standard cutting plane algorithm on average took about 100 to 200 seconds to generate each cut. Remember each cut on average requires solving that uh, forward problem with a new objective function. Within these uh, trust regions, let's say trust regions of sizes uh, 32 and below, we can generate cuts in, on average in, in a second or less. Okay, so now we have to ask the question, um, we can generate cuts you know, much, much faster, often magnitudes faster. Does it come at a cost, right? Do we have to generate more cuts? So the, the answer is generally no. And so, um, in fact, the, the, the answer is that we, can, we often generate many fewer cuts, so our cuts are much stronger as well. And so if we look at the x-axis, this is going to be the cutting plane algorithm. We gave it an enhancement early stop just so it could solve um, a few more iterations. It doesn't actually lead to, uh, just so it could solve a few more instances, it doesn't actually lead to a higher iteration count, but it just gives us more um, instances to compare with. So we have the cutting plane algorithm with the early stop, and then we have the cutting plane algorithm with our trust regions and with the, with the early stop as well. And you can see that um, instances that took, you know, for example, a thousand iterations to solve. Um, with the trust region, now we can solve them in, in oftentimes in a hundred iterations. Right. So these two features um, both reduce cut generation time and reduction in uh, in number of cuts that, that are needed um, allow us to kind of observe um, um, the the performance that we do. Okay, so with that, um, that basically ends um, my section two of, of um, how to solve uh, inverse problems for um, LP and MIP for problems in this kind of classical domain. Um, and so before I move on to the next section, uh, let me pause here to see if there are any questions. Okay. Um, okay, so now I'm going to um, talk about how to solve inverse problems in this new domain, which we'll call noisy or, or data-driven inverse optimization. And so the main motivation behind um, this paradigm of models is, is, um, is on settings in which one, we're unable to fit, find a theta that perfectly fits all of our solutions. And um, two, 
settings in which we may want to avoid overfitting to our solutions if that comes at um, very high cost. And so in these, uh, in, in this paradigm, then we can replace our inverse feasibility constraints. Um, the constraints that we have with proxies of those constraints or relaxations of those constraints, which we'll define as loss functions. Um, and then we'll put those loss functions in the objective. So again, the loss function simply is some kind of measure of the fit of X hat to your optimal set of solutions um, under model input theta. Um, okay. And so a, a variety of different loss functions have been proposed um, in the literature. Um, here, I've just outlined three. Um, um, these three uh, are the uh, objective value loss, sometimes also called suboptimality loss, which just measures the difference in objective value of X hat versus the optimal objective value. So if X hat is optimal under theta, then this loss function is going to be zero. Um, if X hat is not optimal under theta, then uh, this loss function is going to give you some positive value and you're going to try to minimize that. <coughs> decision space in the loss is going to be a loss function that's defined in the, uh, well, in the decision space, meaning um, you wanna find uh, a theta that minimizes the distance between X hat and a optimal solution X star um, when I input theta. And finally, parameter space loss, um, is a problem of where I give a specific theta i to every uh, decision that we observe. And I try to minimize the distance between all of these uh, theta i's. So these are just uh, different loss functions, um, which each you know, come with their own properties um, and uh, different uh, levels of tractability. So I recognize we are uh, 10 minutes away from one. So uh, I'll try to go a bit more quickly. Um, so let me just take the time to kind of go through this loss function and then I'll, I'll, I'll only, I'll quickly go through the other ones. Um, if we're thinking about objective value loss, right, where we're trying to minimize the, uh, uh, this, uh, function here, um, uh, so, sorry, yeah, if we're trying to uh, minimize this function here, then we can set this function as equal to some epsilon and try to minimize um, epsilon in the objective. And again, if you fix epsilon to be zero, then you get back your kind of classical inverse optimization problem. But most often this is used when that classical problem is infeasible. Okay, so for this loss function, um, we can consider similar duality and extreme point arguments um, that I presented from before. And so for example, if your forward problem, meaning this thing here was a linear programming problem, then I can replace uh, constraint 5B with these two constraints, All right? So I'm going to keep the left side here the same but instead of that minimization problem, I'm going to um, give it uh, lambda transpose B, which is just, again, the value, objective value of the dual problem. And um, I'm going to, again, define dual feasibility constraints. And so the main takeaway for this is that under this loss function, um, uh, the inverse problem of an LP is still a linear optimization problem. If you consider that this, um, this um, forward problem is a mixed integer problem, then we can replace constraint 5b with uh, um, this expression, which again is very similar to the one we saw from before, which motivates um, um, uh, the idea that the previous cutting plane algorithm of enumerating extreme points can still be applied to solve this problem in this case. Right, but now if we think about some other uh, loss functions, then the tractability of the problem might change. So for example, if we're thinking about a decision space loss in which we're trying to minimize, uh, find a theta that minimizes the optimal distance um, from X hat to, the distance from X hat to an optimal solution, 
then this problem becomes is no longer linear, even for linear forward problems. And the reason is because if you try to write out the um, optimality conditions, you have to simultaneously find a theta and an x um, in this inverse problem. And so uh, in many cases, you can uh, linearize this by uh, introducing discrete uh, variables, but now the inverse problem um, is going to be a MIP rather than a linear optimization problem. So this is a, an example of a loss function that, um, that uh, changes the tractability of the model. Okay, and so finally, um, we have this other parameter space loss. I'm going to skip this um, and uh, simply say that the main takeaway um, from this section is that um, in this kind of noisy and data-driven regime, there's various um, loss functions that you can consider each of them will result in different levels of tractability. They might be appropriate in different settings, depending on what kind of assumptions you've made um, about the problem that you're studying. And they may also um, require kind of their own uh, solution methods. Okay. Um, well, I only have two slides left, so I'll, I'll just uh, stop for questions at the end. Um, so in summary today, we saw that inverse optimization can be used among other things to learn utility functions and preferences um, in various application domains. Um, the defining feature of inverse optimization is uh, this inverse feasibility constraint or proxies of this constraint that you can put in the objective function. And to handle these uh, constraints or these loss functions, we often rely on uh, optimality conditions that we can reformulate um, into and solve as monolithic formulations or um, or generate iteratively uh, using cutting plane algorithms. Okay, and so finally, um, um, I wanted to briefly give my own perspective and and uh, research outlook on this area. Um, so as I discussed at the beginning, um, I think inverse optimization is, is really in its nascency, and I think there are a lot of promising research uh, questions here and, and thesis projects for, for students who are, in, who are listening. Um, so I've divided kind of my own research outlook into three parts. The first is methodological research, which is really about, which is thinking about how to solve IO problems under different settings. And so here I've listed examples of, of settings in which there have been only a handful of papers. And so these include estimating constraint parameters, um, estimating parameters when you um, assume additional kind of statistical information, um, developing faster solution methods, either through some of the uh, uh, methods I've discussed or through new methods and learning in an online fashion rather than um, in this kind of offline batch uh, type procedure that I've been uh, describing. Um, the second um, area would be trying to bring IO into uh, new application areas. And so one quick example of this, which I like, is the use of inverse optimization to parameterize uh, mathematical models that, uh, mathematical programs that model naturally occurring systems like decentralized traffic flow and, and cellular uh, uh, biological processes. So that's been neat. And finally, I think it's important to try to, because inverse optimization is in its early stages of development, um, I think it's important to try to draw uh, stronger and more rigorous connections between IO and these more mature fields, um, where, for example, inverse reinforcement learning can be considered as IO, but for forward problems, which are modeled as MDTs, um, you have bandits and or preference elicitation techniques in which the learner is actively engaging with the person they're trying to learn from. And there's also this rich literature and economics about them, real preferences and different kinds of choice models. And I think it would be um, very interesting to, um, to draw kind of connections between IO and these uh, more established fields. Okay, so with that, I, I wanted to say uh, thanks for listening and thanks everyone for sticking until the end. Um, I'm happy to take questions now or offline by email. And uh, if you do have to run, I look forward to seeing everyone at uh, optimization days. Thanks.